Thanks to this episode's sponsor, the coldest water bottle, here's Hamster's Hot Take. If you're gonna call your indie games retro, then at the very least go through the effort of making it look authentic. Even without modern compression, actual retro games were around 100 kilobytes. If your parallaxing, 3D animations, particle effects, and crystal clear voice and music sampling result in your game being larger by a factor of several thousand compared to actual retro games, you're not only coming off as blatantly misrepresenting your inspiration, but also misdirecting the younger generation who is now missing out on what makes retro games so impressive to begin with. You know, I haven't had to go downstairs for three days because of this thing. The coldest water bottle is a fully insulated heavy-duty beast. You'd think people would invest in well-made useful products that last, but for some reason they keep buying these jank plastic water bottles that leak, condensate, and melt ice like it was their job. I've been searching for a good one as well, primarily due to Kim breaking everything we buy, but sorry Kim, this one's mine. The coldest water bottle keeps your drink cold for literal days with this industrial insulation technology, which even prevents condensation from escaping, ranging from 12-ounce kids' bottles to freaking gallon-sized ice baths. Grab one of these puppies and never buy another water bottle again with the affiliate link in the description and use the promo code HAMSTER for an extra 10% off your entire order. Coldest also hosts weekly giveaways, so be sure to sign up with the link below for a chance to win one of these puppies. Oh man, what are we gonna do? Hey, HAMSTER! Jeez, do you have to keep bursting in here like that? But the fans have high expectations for Metroid making the big jump to 3D, and I have zero ideas! So what? Just do what we always do! But how are we supposed to recreate what worked before, but in a brand new perspective? Oh shoot, you're right. Can't we just put it off? We already skipped an entire console generation! We can't do that again! If you keep this up any longer, I'm gonna strangle you! Don't ruin the illusion! I'm the one who edits these videos! I'm so sorry! Stop doing that! <laughs> If you can believe it, I first found Metroid Prime to be cool, but nothing outrageously amazing or anything. I kind of fell out of my first playthrough somewhere around the Phazon Mines. I admit to being an uncultured swine. A few years later, I gave it another shot, and by then I could better appreciate the atmospheric world and brilliant innovations that reimagined Metroid in the third dimension. It's safe to say that growing past my younger ignorance in game design, I now see Metroid Prime not only as a monumental work of art for the gaming industry, but also one of the greatest video games ever made. Spoiler alert, we like this game a lot, and here Here's why. Prime is effectively Super Metroid in 3D, but the crazy amount of gameplay hurdles the devs needed to solve to make that 2D to 3D jump even happen effectively is what makes it so astonishing. Metroid Prime is a 3D action puzzle platformer with first-person tank and lock-on aiming controls. This departure alone was to blame for so many players, myself included, feeling uneasy about this new direction at first glance. But after playing it, I couldn't imagine Prime any other way. With a third dimension, level design and puzzles could be far more complex than before, and the open alien world could be better constructed with overlapping floors, interconnected secrets and passageways, an incredibly useful 3D map feature simplifying all that chaos, allowing you to orbit, rotate, zoom, and even reference in your heads-up display, so getting lost is a non-issue. Even if you manage to stray or wander or too far, Samus's suit will scan the area and give you hints on suspicious locations to investigate. This retains meaningful flavor and immersion while still helping players who are lost. This should honestly be a staple in all Metroid games going forward. Minimal, flavorful hints and only when necessary. Zero Mission, I'm looking at you. So you'd think three-dimensional level design would be literally cubing the potential hiding places for pathways and pickups like missiles and energy tanks, and you'd be right. But with Samus's new visors, finding them isn't so imposing. Aside from the ominous humming whoom sound you'll hear when goodies are close by, helping players out with the hot and cold game. The new scan visor allows Samus to catalog and decipher lore entries, identify enemy and boss intel, plus interact with electronics like elevators. It's the perfect mechanism for on-demand story and lore embellishments, as well as acting as a clever hint system. Also new is the thermal visor, allowing Samus to track heat sources from either enemies or circuitry, allowing for clever puzzle solving and identifying of enemy weak points. Returning from Super Metroid is the X-Ray visor, allowing Samus to once again see through walls and enemies to reveal pickup secrets and vulnerabilities. And of course we have the combat visor, your basic vision for unaided sight and shooting. 
But if need be, you can shoot in all but the scan visor, and even flip between visors at any moment in combat, and thankfully, they're all utilized just enough to feel like real useful upgrades. On top of the four visors, Samus also equips up to four beams as well, all with unique properties and uses throughout the game, accessed by a directional flick of the C-stick, while the visors use the D-pad. So you start with just the power beam, which due to its high rate of fire can hold up in almost any fight, even in late game. The wave beam fires three shots in parabolic waves, and it's especially helpful in overloading enemies or electronics with a surge of electricity. The ice beam fires a concentrated shotgun blast of ice like a cannon, and has the ability to freeze certain enemies solid like the infamous Metroids. And lastly, she unlocks the plasma beam, which superheats its targets, going so far as to completely obliterate some enemies with a full charge, melting them down to nothing instantly. It is so freaking satisfying. Even more so are the new missile upgrade integrations to make their beam's charged attacks even beefier by shooting a bunch of missiles alongside the charge shot itself. They're all just fun bonus extra powerful attacks and totally unnecessary for beating the game. The charged power beam fires a traditional super missile, the Wave Beam fires the Wave Buster, a constant stream of energy and missiles totally not ripped from Ghostbusters. The Ice Beam charges into the Ice Spreader, a massive single icy blast. And the Plasma Beam becomes a continuous missile-fueled flamethrower, which is just as devastating and amazing as it sounds. There are plenty of enemies and situations where you'll need certain beams or visors to progress or overcome challenges. And fortunately, the sharp controls and UI keep you feeling like a powerful bounty hunter and less disoriented from overcomplication. All Samus's other upgrades are modified for 3D platforming to avoid breaking the game, like Space Jump becoming a double jump, Morph Ball bombs only letting you jump twice and not infinitely anymore, and the Spider Ball requiring magnetic rails to function so it can't be used everywhere. Understandable nerfs. The Power Suit, Various Suit, and Gravity Suit all reprise their traditional 2D roles, with the new Phazon Suit being the new ultimate go-anywhere best defense upgrade, allowing Samus to walk unaffected through dangerously irradiated glowy goop called Phazon without the brain cancer. Even the Power Bombs and Grapple Beam make a return, allowing Samus to drop massive explosions and swing across large gaps. There's also the new Boost Ball for ramp puzzles and extra speed. I know we're spending a lot of time just on the power-ups, but they're all so cool and implemented so well that they all deserve mentioning as they define the gameplay. Long story short, the controls and mechanics are solid, the upgrades are awesome, and the open exploration of the winding 3D map perfectly reflects the best of what 2D exploration even offered. And then there's the bosses! And enemies in general! This world just feels so alien and dangerous while there's dozens of unique creatures and boss encounters, all giving you a reason to utilize your full arsenal, but aren't overly punishing so players aren't discouraged from exploring and backtracking. There are so many cool interactions in this game, like when you can set some captive Metroids loose on the unsuspecting space pirates, or when the lights suddenly shut down and you need to use your thermals to survive and escape the blackout ambush. This game still does have its scary moments. But undoubtedly, the cornerstone of the gameplay is in the freedom to explore the open map at your own pace, slowly growing in strength along your travels and uncovering abilities that both assist you in combat and traversal in an addictive feedback loop. It never gets old, especially if you spice things up with a randomizer. Or you could just join us in our own randomized Let's Play Shameless Blood. Let's cut to the chase. Metroid Prime is the best looking GameCube game- Hold on, you can't just- Well... With a simple up res, this game could easily pass as a modern Switch title. The models, animations, and special effects all create the magnificent illusion of a fully living atmospheric alien world. Sure, it looks nice and all, but good graphics become great with a fine-tuned attention to detail. Oh, like how Samus's HUD shows dynamic proximity to hazards like heat and radiation? Or how the X-ray visor reveals that Samus is making different hand gestures to switch between beam types and fire? Yeah, and how flashes of bright light or fog or explosions let you see her face reflected in the visor, and the in-depth design of the decrepit lore-packed Chozo ruins and environments. You know, this was that long story I was trying to cut short. I know, it's just one of the best looking GameCube games. Okay, moving on! So, canonically, the Prime series is a little weird. It happens between Metroid 1 and 2, and some fans have even debated whether it is officially canon at all. To which I say, why is Ridley in Samus Returns recovering from his metaform if it never happened? I think we can all put that stupid baseless diversion to rest now. Thanks, Mercury Steam! 
Now, you've heard me describe my ideal storytelling in games like Metal Gear Solid and The Witcher, where it's there in droves when you want it and gone when you don't. Well, due to the scan visor being your on-demand lore outlet, Metroid Prime is storytelling at its absolute finest. Now, hold up, I still get to talk about what happens anyway, right? Let's be honest, you're gonna do it even if I say no. Samus responds to a distress beacon and investigates the frigate Orpheon, which turns out to be a space pirate transportation and research complex, recovering from a recent and vicious attack. After defeating the Parasite Queen at the core of the facility, Samus is hit with an electrical blast causing nearly all of her suit's power-ups to malfunction. Because of course. Come on, at least we have a reason to start from square one this time. Plus it's miles better than what actually happened in- No! So while escaping, Samus stumbles across the very mechanized and very much alive Ridley, whom Samus chases out of the self-destructing facility and down to the planet below, Talon 4, as the entire frigate breaks apart and plummets to the surface. From here, the non-linearity kicks in. While tailing Ridley to investigate how he survived Metroid 1, Samus discovers the ancient Chozo ruins, space pirate bases, and learns of a massive meteor that crash-landed ages ago on Talon 4. This meteor, the Chozo called the Great Poison, brought with it the highly radioactive and corrupting Phazon, that would later be mined by the invading space pirates who began experimenting with the deadly substance for its potential as an energy source and experimental bioweapons. You even explore the crashed sunken frigate Orpheon on your journey. As if the Super Metroid similarities weren't enough with chasing Ridley to a planet, exploring its various elemental biomes, and learning about the world's dead civilization before ultimately, before ultimately discovering the Chozo Temple, blocking away the source of the infection below, and collecting 12 artifacts to release the seal and descend into the impact crater and eliminate the monstrous creature at its core known only to the Chozo as the Worm. Some people complain about backtracking for the artifacts, but if you're diligent with your searching and procuring of items throughout the game as you should be in Metroid titles, then you'll probably have several before you're even required to start hunting them down by the end. Plus, the game itself even gives you hints on tracking down any stragglers, so... Anyway, immediately after opening the seal, Meta Ridley ambushes Samus in an intense and highly anticipated final battle. Except not really, not really, not really, not really, not really? One more time. So after defeating Meta Ridley, Samus descends into the Impact Crater, discovering the highly mutated source of the infection, the bringer of the Great Poison itself, the Metroid Prime. This fight is awesome. The Prime is immune to all but one of your beams at once, with its current weakness revealed by its current color, where it takes on those attack attributes. After several phases, its outer shell breaks away and reveals its floating core. The true form of the Metroid Prime can spawn Metroids and shift in and out of visibility for all but one of your visors, and the only way to damage it is by standing in its discharged pools of Phazon and obliterating it with your newly charged Phazon beam. Because Super Metroid references! After blasting the Prime down to a literal puddle, it uses the last of its strength to yank Samus's Phazon suit away and into the radioactive muck, as Samus escapes from the collapsing crater and watches as it all crumble away from the safety of her ship with the comfort of knowing she'd eliminated the great poison that corrupted Talon Force Chozo, the race to which she owes her life. That is, unless you collected 100% of the pickups for a hidden final scene revealing that from the bubbling puddle of Phazon that is the remains of Metroid Prime, a grotesque human arm emerges with a menacing eye growing out of the back of its hand. It's gross and awesome! And reveals that the Prime was simply taking on the form of whatever it believed to be the strongest creature in the galaxy. Previously a heavily mutated Metroid, and has now become the only known entity powerful enough to defeat it, a Dark Samus. So sure, that's what happens. But the real story is in discovering the hidden lore scans, piecing together the mystery of the Chozo, the space pirates, and the great poison that corrupted Talon 4. The game practically set the standard for uncovering the mysteries of a dead world in Metroidvania storytelling. And unfortunately didn't set the standard for well thought out dark doppelganger villain backstories. A little effort goes a long way, guys! Good video game music doesn't just set the atmosphere, but the raw emotion for the player to experience. Pulling them into the scene with memorable and impactful immersion, and this soundtrack... This is the best soundtrack I've ever heard! What's a little much? Each track is so great at what it does that I can only describe them by their uniquely expressed emotions of mystery, Fear, wonder, excitement, danger, and triumph as regular descriptions just can't do them enough justice. It doesn't mean I can't try. 
That corny stereotypical alien sound we all know gets masterfully utilized to orchestrate remixed Metroid classics like Norfair from Super and various new memorable melodies like Sunken Frigate and Fendrana Drifts. And the main theme is so darn good! Especially when it gets a glorious reprise during the last phase of the final boss. Don't forget good sound design also means solid sound effects and audio cues. No other game comes close to having as many tracks as Metroid Prime Download it on my computer, and I listen to a ton of game music. So yeah, you could say it's pretty good. Like a radiant sexual supernova kind of good. I don't know where Nintendo gets off selling drugs to kids, but here you go. Retro Studios was given an impossible job of revitalizing a dormant 2D classic in an entirely new perspective without compromising the original, and not only crushed their goals, but also created an entirely new masterpiece in the process. And if you don't think that's a big deal, just look what happened when Team Ninja tried the same thing. <laughs> the positive gamer in me. 10 out of 10! It's outstanding! Incredible! Amazing! Breathtaking! Are you shocked? I mean, really? Me? Come on! What were you expecting after I called the game a sexual supernova? The critical gamer in me actually thought long and hard over this, debating whether or not this game's few shortcomings hold back its historic achievements in game design, and determined after way too much internal deliberation that Metroid Prime fully deserves to be honored with a 10 out of 10 being nothing less than a brilliant solution to an impossible problem. You got a problem with that? Well, I don't care. This is my show. And for as critical as I clearly am with games, these few and far between double 10 out of 10 scores should stand out as the true cream of the crop in every regard, like Metroid Prime. But what do you think? Tell us how your positive and critical sides rate Metroid Prime in the comments below. Personal enjoyment is always going to be arbitrary, but if you're ignoring this game's colossal critical achievements, then you're just playing with yourself. Special thanks this week goes to Isabel for making this adorable Ridley plushie and sending it my way. She's also the one doing Metroid 35 uh, Zane on Twitter. You can check out, I am included in that. And I'm also joining her on her podcast, Face On Labs, with a new episode. Also Metroid related, check that out. Thanks for watching. Remember to like and subscribe for more, and use the links in the description to nominate future episodes. Thank you to our Patreon members, Atomic Thomas, Cameron, Arrow, Rowan, Erica, Shayam, Sid, and Squad Fam. Boop!